Shoulder Dystocia, Green Top Guideline Number 42, Second Edition, March 2012. Background: Shoulder dystocia is defined as a vaginal cephalic delivery that requires additional obstetric maneuvers to deliver the fetus after the head has delivered and gentle traction has failed. An objective diagnosis of prolongation of head-to-body delivery time of more than 60 seconds has also been proposed. Shoulder dystocia occurs when either the anterior or less commonly the posterior fetal shoulder impacts on the maternal symphysis or sacral promontory respectively. There is a wide variation in the reported incidence of shoulder dystocia between 0.58% and 0.70%. There can be significant perinatal morbidity and mortality associated with the condition even when it is managed appropriately. Maternal morbidity is increased, particularly the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage, equivalent to 11%, as well as third and fourth degree perineal tears, or 3.8%. Brachial plexus injury, or BPI, is one of the most important fetal complications of shoulder dystocia, complicating 2.3% to 16% of such deliveries. Most cases of brachial plexus injury resolve without permanent disability, with fewer than 10%, resulting in permanent neurological dysfunction. In the UK and Ireland, the incidence of brachial plexus injury was 0.43 per 1,000 live births. Where shoulder dystocia occurs, larger infants are more likely to suffer a permanent brachial plexus injury after shoulder dystocia. Not all injuries are due to excess traction by healthcare professionals, and there is a significant body of evidence suggesting that maternal propulsive force may contribute to some of these injuries. Moreover, a substantial minority of brachial plexus injuries are not associated with clinically evident shoulder dystocia with brachial plexus injuries occurring after uncomplicated caesarean sections. When brachial plexus injury is discussed legally, it is important to determine whether the affected shoulder was anterior or posterior at the time of delivery because damage to the plexus of the posterior shoulder is considered unlikely to be due to action by the healthcare professional. Prediction can shoulder dystocia be predicted? Clinicians should be aware of existing risk factors in laboring women and must always be alert to the possibility of shoulder dystocia. Risk assessments for the prediction of shoulder dystocia are insufficiently predictive to allow prevention of the large majority of cases. A number of antenatal and intrapartum characteristics have been reported to be associated with shoulder dystocia, but statistical modeling has shown that these risk factors have a low positive predictive value, both singly and in combination. There is a relationship between fetal size and shoulder dystocia, but it is not a good predictor, partly because fetal size is difficult to determine accurately but also because the large majority of infants with a birth weight of greater than or equal to 4,500 grams do not develop shoulder dystocia. Equally important, 48% of births complicated by shoulder dystocia occur with infants who weigh less than 4,000 grams. Infants of diabetic mothers have a 2-4 to four fold increased risk of shoulder dystocia compared with infants of the same birth weight born to non-diabetic mothers. Table number 1 Factors associated with shoulder dystocia Pre-labor Previous shoulder dystocia Macrosomia equivalent to greater than 4.5 kilograms Diabetes mellitus, 
maternal body mass index of greater than 30 kg per square meters and induction of labor. Intrapartum Prolonged first stage of labor Secondary arrest Prolonged second stage of labor Oxytocin augmentation and assisted vaginal delivery Prevention of shoulder dystocia Management of suspected fetal macrosomia Thus induction of labor prevent shoulder dystocia Induction of labor does not prevent shoulder dystocia in non-diabetic women with a suspected macrosomic fetus. Induction of labor at term can reduce the incidence of shoulder dystocia in women with gestational diabetes. Should elective cesarean section be recommended for suspected fetal macrosomia to prevent brachial plexus injury, Elective cesarean section should be considered to reduce the potential morbidity for pregnancies complicated by pre-existing or gestational diabetes regardless of treatment with an estimated fetal weight of greater than 4.5 kilograms. What are the recommendations for future pregnancy? What is the appropriate mode of delivery for the women with a previous episode of shoulder dystocia? Either cesarean section or vaginal delivery can be appropriate after a previous shoulder dystocia. The decision should be made jointly by the women and her carers. The rate of shoulder dystocia in women who have had a previous shoulder dystocia has been reported to be 10 times higher than the rate in the general population. There is a reported recurrence rate of shoulder dystocia of between 1% and 25%. Cesarean section might have been advocated for pregnancies after severe shoulder dystocia, particularly with a neonatal poor outcome. Factors such as the severity of any previous neonatal or maternal injury predicted fetal size, and maternal choice should all be considered and discussed with the woman and her family when making plans for the next delivery.